Well, good morning. Damon, thank you so much for coming and helping lead us in worship and your family being here. We're just, we're just so glad for you to be with us and we appreciate your gift of song and leadership and worship is just great. You really do have a beautiful, beautiful voice. I was over here singing harmony with you. It may not have been quite right, but it was as close as I could get. Well, good morning, church. I want you to take out your Bibles and um, you know, Rex, I appreciate you going to the last verse of that hymn. You knew I was preaching today, so we got to get on, get on with it so Robbie can get finished with what he's got to say. Um, I want you to open your Bibles to 2 Timothy. Over these next few weeks, we're going to be looking through this letter of 2 Timothy. We're going to start today in verse 3, and we're going to more or less go verse by verse. We'll, we'll, we'll miss a few here and there, but we're going to try to study through this entire book, and, or this entire letter actually, and um, there's a reason I believe God wants us to go through this letter. I, those of you that um, came to the gathering on Wednesday nights last semester during the spring, you know that I preached through 1 Timothy in the spring. And 1 Timothy, what a, what a great letter. If you did not participate in that, if you weren't here during the gathering last semester, my encouragement to you this week is to go home and to read through 1 Timothy three or four times. It's only six chapters. It's really, really short. But make that maybe part of your quiet time over the next several days. And read through 1 Timothy and get, a, get an understanding of where Paul is coming from as he begins this process that we're going to be talking more in depth about as we look at 2 Timothy. Um, and it's this process that you and I get to participate in, but I'm not so sure we really stop and think about it as often as we should. But it's a process, if you look in your bulletin, I've titled this series, Take Up the Torch. And you and I get to participate in this process as well in the church. And we might call it, um, in our church lingo today, we might call this discipleship or mentoring. But this is a process that the Lord established in the church a long, long time ago. And He's given us very specific and I think beautiful guidelines to go by. But this is something that we just don't talk about very much. We don't talk about the importance of the older generations pouring into the younger generations and the younger generations receiving well what is being passed down to them you know, through faith. And so we're going to be looking at this torch as, a, as an example. As Heather, Heather made this. She's a lot more creative than I am. But we're going to be thinking about this torch and what it represents. This torch may represent a particular area of ministry that God has gifted you in. It may represent a particular spiritual gift. It represents, for, for sure, it represents the gospel. This torch represents the light of Jesus Christ in the world. And you and I get to participate in carrying it on from generation to generation and holding high the torch of Christ to all who would come to Him. But we don't always do that well. We don't always do that intentionally like we're taught in the Scriptures. And so we're going to look, as we go through 2 Timothy, we're going to look at how God has laid out for us this process of taking up and passing on the torch of ministry, the torch of the gospel. And as we, as we go through this letter, I want you to think and I, I want you to put yourself into one of three positions. And I talked about some of this. Like, this is kind of intro B. I did intro A this past Wednesday. And that's, that's kind of how this series is going to go. I'm going to preach through, through verses 3 through, through 7 today. I'm going to preach through verses 8 through 14 this coming Wednesday night. And then we'll be in chapter 2 next Sunday. And so if you come on Sunday morning and you come on Wednesday night, you'll hear it all. If you only come on Sunday morning, you'll hear half. If you only come on Wednesday night, you'll hear the other half. And I guess you'll have to talk to your friends about what you missed. Does everybody understand where we're going from here? All right, very good. I needed a breath there. But I want you to put yourself in one of three positions. You're either going to be in the position of Paul. Maybe you have known the Lord for a long time, been walking faithfully, serving Him in the church for years and years and years, and you have gained a lot of wisdom in how to serve the Lord and how to follow Him. And you've gained a lot of wisdom about particular areas of ministry that God has called you to. You understand your spiritual gifts fairly well. You've had a lot of successes in following the Lord. And you've probably had your share of failures that have built up the wisdom that God has put in you. 
and you are a Paul. All of your mentors have, have passed on, have gone on to be with the Lord. And now the torch sits solely in your hand. And you're a Paul. It's time for you to, to learn how and to begin that process of, of bringing others along and getting their hands on that torch and helping them learn how they can take up that torch and take it well from you to be able to pass it on to the next generation behind them. Some of you, Pauls, you might, as we go through this, this letter, you might find, you know what, Robbie, if I'm just really honest, I've kind of dropped the torch. I got, I got burnt out in ministry. I got tired of doing the same old thing. I got, I got to a point where I felt like nobody wanted to take the torch from me, so I retired from my job, and I also retired from my ministry in the church. And let me tell you this. Let me encourage you and challenge you in this way. If you're willing to admit that maybe you've dropped or laid the torch down, you can still pick it back up. But let me also challenge you in this. There is no retirement plan from ministry. The retirement plan that Jesus has laid out for us, when He is ready for you to be finished with ministry, He will call you home to be with Him. There is still something, if there, are, if there is breath in your lungs, if you at least have the ability to pray, then in some way your hand is still to be on the torch. You may be at home today. You may not be able to come to church anymore. This is your church home and you have invested years and years and years in the life of this particular fellowship. And you say, Robbie, I really want to be able to keep my hand on the torch, but I can't. But oh, you can. Your hand is still on the torch. Maybe you don't bear the full weight of it anymore, but your hand of prayer, your letters of encouragement... Your words of encouragement. You can maybe pick up the phone and call somebody that you know is in that same area of ministry that you used to give your life to. And you can still help to pass the torch on. So some of you are in the position of Paul and Paul alone. Some of us in this room, you're in the, you're in the position solely of Timothy. You're either young in your faith, maybe you're new in the church, Maybe you're a teenager or in your 20s or maybe even your early 30s. You're just, you're just kind of starting to figure out who you are in Christ and how the Lord has gifted you. Maybe this is something that's never even been on your radar. Maybe you've grown up in church, but church to you has just been, what, what am I supposed to get out of it? You've been raised and somehow in your mindset, you just show up here on Sunday morning and you sit in a pew and it never has even crossed your mind that there is something for you to do that you're missing out on. But you're a Timothy, and you're going to learn as we go through this letter, you're going, to see, you're going to sense the Holy Spirit speaking to you and saying, you need other people that are older than you, that are wiser than you, that have gone before you to invest in you. You need their wisdom. And I said this this past Wednesday night, for all of our younger folks, our Timothys in the room that are worshiping with us today, here's the, here's the truth. You will never arrive where God wants you to be in your spiritual life the way he wants you to arrive there without the investment of those who have gone before you. Not that the Lord can't get you there. We're going to talk some about that. The Holy Spirit does step in. Sometimes the torch does get dropped. And we just have to pick it up and figure out how to get going. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. But when there are people who are willing to pass that torch on to you, it is your responsibility and your privilege as a Timothy not to yank it out of somebody's hand to say, I have a better idea of how to do that. I can do it better than you and you've been doing it the same way forever and I've got... No, 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 no. You have the opportunity to say, teach me, guide me, show me how to put my hand firmly on this torch and how to carry it well with my gifts and my talents and the way God is le leading me, help me become who God has called me to be. That is such a privilege that we don't talk a lot about in our world today. Especially we don't talk about it in the church like we should. Where we're going to for the next several weeks. Some of you are solely in the position of Timothy. But then there are some of us, and I, I feel like I'm in this category who really are kind of in both situations. So position number three is that in some ways you're a Paul. In some ways there, there, you've been serving and you, 
you, you've learned a lot and grown a lot in ministry, but there are people that have, 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 are coming up underneath you that it's time to start learning to pass the torch on to and to start to invest in and starting to disciple that younger generation. Maybe there are some teenagers or some 20-somethings that you need to be taking under your wing. So in that, in that respect, you're a Paul. But at the same time, you're, you're also still in need, and I know I am still in need of people older and wiser that are praying over you and encouraging you and teaching you how to continue to take that torch. Here's the, here's the, the way it should always be. There should always be at least two hands on the torch. At least. There is a Paul and there is at least a Timothy. On, hand on the torch at all times. And sometimes there are three. Sometimes there's a, a, an older Paul and kind of a in the middle Paul and, and a Timothy at the same time. Sometimes there are three. But there are always to be at least two hands on the torch. And as we look at the letter of 2 Timothy here, we are seeing this torch being passed. Officially being passed. Now, if you go back and you'll read through 1 Timothy, you'll see the beginnings of this process. It's not a moment. It's not something that you walk up to somebody and the, or, you know, the nominating committee says, Hey, will you do this job and figure out how to do it? Here you go. That's not how it works. It's a process of investing your life into someone or maybe several someones. But it's a process, and we see as we read through 1 Timothy, we see the beginnings of Paul really pouring into Timothy and teaching Timothy. And if you know a whole lot about, you know, know really anything more about Paul and Timothy's relationship, you know that they spent a great deal of time traveling together and planting churches together. I believe that Timothy helped to actually pen several of the other letters that Paul sent out to other churches in the New Testament. Timothy and Paul had a close, intimate relationship, and we're going to see that illustrated here. In these first few verses. But we see in 1 Timothy, we see a very vibrant Paul. A Paul who is still fully in ministry mode. He is still fighting the good fight and inviting Timothy to join him in fighting that good fight. He is still going strong. But then here we find him in 2 Timothy a few years later. We find him in a, a dark, cold prison cell. And he is at a place in his life where he realizes that his ministry years are coming to an end and probably his life is coming to an end. He still longs to see Timothy, but in 1 Timothy it's, I'm coming to see you. In 2 Timothy it's, please come and see me. Now we don't know whether that ever happened or not. We don't know if Timothy ever made it to Paul before Paul was executed. But we know he wanted him to come. So as far as we know, this is the last interaction that we know about between Paul, Timothy's father in the faith, and Timothy, Paul's son in the faith. Now Paul had other, other folks that he invested in. You could say Silas, you could say um, Barnabas, you could say John Mark, you could say Luke. I mean, there were several other people that, that Paul mentored. Timothy wasn't the only one. He just happens to be the one we know the most about. So I want us to look at these few verses and glean a few things, a few practical steps, a few, few practical things that you and I need to know to begin this process of taking up and passing on the torch. And as we go through this letter, I'm going to be, giving, I'm going to be putting tools in your hand. I'm going to remove every possible excuse that I can think of for you to actually do this. This isn't going to be something where you can come on Sunday morning and Wednesday night and you can hear Robbie talk and then it's over. I'm going to be challenging you to actually do this. Get involved. This is what the Lord wants us as First Baptist Church, and I believe every church personally, this is what He wants us to do for, the, for His glory, to further His gospel, to effectively reach people for Christ here in Florence and around the world. This is where it starts. So look here in verse 3. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3. Paul says to Timothy, I thank God whom I serve as did my ancestors with a clear conscience. And this is very important. This is something that's easy to glaze over and I don't want to glaze over it. For all of you Pauls here that are worshiping with us this morning, it is very important 
in order for you to effectively disciple and mentor someone else in the faith, it's very important that you are able to approach God with a clear conscience. Now, Paul did not always have a clear conscience. You can go back to Romans 7, and you can read Romans 7, and Paul will tell you about his conscience and how he felt before he was converted. Paul realized there was something missing in his life. He just didn't know what it was. But then Jesus met him on the road to Damascus and completely, radically changed him. Now, Paul is not saying that he is without sin. He's not saying he's perfect. But he is transparent. He is in a position in his life where he is transparent before the Lord. He's not, there's nothing hidden. There's, there's, he's not pretending to be someone he's not. And so for all of you Pauls in the room, that is very important for you. Is that you are clear. You have a clear conscience with the Lord that you aren't putting on. That you're not, that you're not carrying around hidden and unconfessed sin. Dr. Kent Hughes wrote a beautiful commentary um, on 1st and 2nd Timothy and Titus, the pastoral epistles. And there was a quote, and I can't say it any better than this, and so I want to read what he said in regards to this particular very important nugget of truth here of, of Paul having a clear conscience. He says this. He says, The old warrior is chained in a dripping winter-cold dungeon awaiting the executioner's axe. And as he surveys his life, his conversion, and then the kaleidoscope of sermons preached and shipwrecks and confrontations, deliverances, stonings, beatings, and victories. As Paul looks back and surveys all of that, his conscience is absolutely clear. There is no guilt, no weight of unresolved sins, nothing to confess. He has been true to the gospel and he's been true to his calling. He was not sinless, but he was blameless and he was faithful. Could you say that about your life? Or are you like many believers in our churches who are trying to put on a face? Because if you are, I would beg you today to stop and say, Lord, I confess everything to you. Because here's, here's how this is going to work. If you're willing to invest yourself into someone that's coming along behind you, and you have hidden and unconfessed sin, it's going to hinder your effectiveness to them. And one day, here's what's going to happen. Some Timothy of yours is going to see you fall, and it's going to crush their faith. Now, that doesn't mean that you're perfect. I'm going to use my grandfather as an example. I could use people here in this congregation as examples, but as soon as I pick somebody, I'm going to leave people out, so I know better than to do that. I'm going to pick my grandfather as my example of probably the best person in my life that has passed the torch on to me. And if you were here Wednesday night, you heard the whole very long story, and I'm only going to share a couple of things with you today. My grandfather poured his heart, soul, and strength into myself and my brother as I was growing up. I lost my grandfather. He passed, he passed away in a plane crash with my father when I was 25. But I had him for 25 years. And folks, I had 100% of my grandfather. He held nothing back from me. And as I got older, my grandfather, I think, was very much in this position in life where his conscience was clear. He was far from perfect. He didn't get everything right. And he knew that. But as I got older... And as, as things became more appropriate, he, you know, there were things when I was young that were not appropriate for him to share. Some places where he had fallen short, some places where he had made mistakes that were not appropriate to share with me when I was young. By the time I was married, he began to share more and more of those, those places in his life. And let me tell you something, I needed to know my, fa my grandfather's strengths and I needed to know his weaknesses. I needed to learn from his successes, and I needed to learn from his failures. My grandfather's desire was, I think, initially, I think his desire was not to pass on to me the torch of full-time ministry, because my grandfather wasn't a full-time minister. He was one of the best gospel communicators I ever knew. But he was a businessman. And I think his original desire was to pass on to my brother and I the torch of the business 
But when I told him I I felt called into full-time vocational ministry, that didn't sit really well with him at first. And he kind of tried to talk me out of it. Not out of ministry in general, but just out of it being my career. Because I've built this business for you. And that was a difficult time for me because in a way I kind of felt like from time to time I felt like I was going against my grandfather's wishes, which wasn't the case, but it was my immature way of seeing it at the time. But it was a real challenge for me to move into the ministry and feel like I was going in a direction my grandfather didn't think I should go. But on the day I was ordained, I think my grandfather realized, wait a minute, the most important torch that I could have ever passed to Robbie was not the business. It was my heart and passion for the Lord. And he passed that on well. And he came to me as I was, he was the last person to go through the line and I was up in front of my home church on my knees as we do in ordination ceremonies. And he came by and he laid his hands on my head and he was crying, which I didn't hear my grandfather cry very often. And he said two things. He said, Robbie, I'm sorry. And I was wrong. And in that moment, he took the torch of ministry and he handed it to me. There are many of you in this room who have the opportunity to do the very same thing for some young Timothys in this room. But your consciences need to be clear. He says his conscience is clear and then he says, as I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day. My challenge to you, the first practical step you can take in discipling someone else is prayer. Who are you praying for? Are you praying for anyone? Those of you who are Paul's in the room, are you praying that God would send you some Timothys? That he would give, that he would put on your heart some people in this congregation that you could pour your heart and soul into? Because Paul prayed for Timothy constantly, night and day. I don't think he's exaggerating here. I think Timothy was very important to Paul. And he poured his heart and soul into him. And he prayed over him constantly. Those of you who are in the position of Timothy here this morning, are you praying and asking God that he would send you some Pauls in this congregation that could lead you and teach you and pray for you and love you and guide you? If you're not, today needs to be the day that that starts. Start praying that God would send you some Timothys. Start praying that God would send you some Pauls. And then once God starts to lay those people on your heart, because I believe he will, I believe he will lay specific people on your heart. The more fervently you pray, the more clearly he will speak. And as he does, then you start praying specifically. And then you enter into an intentional relationship, just like Paul did with Timothy, an intentional relationship with those people and guide them and direct them or learn from them and appreciate the gifts that they give to you. Paul prayed for Timothy constantly and consistently. Who are you praying for? Then look at verses 4 and 5. He says, as I remember your tears, I long to see you that I may be filled with joy. I'm reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt, dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I'm sure dwells in you as well. Paul knew Timothy. He knew Timothy well. He says, I remember your tears. He he knew what made Timothy cry for joy, and he knew what made him cry in pain. He knew Timothy well. And Timothy brought brought Paul what? When Paul thought of Timothy, what did that bring to Paul? Joy, yes, it's written right there in the Bible. If you ever have a question, look down at your Bible. It's usually written there, okay? He brought Paul joy. Now, here's the thing. I've already told the Timothys, in the room that it is vital that they have a relationship with a Paul in this church, but here's the truth for all of you Pauls. You need the Timothys in this church just as much. Maybe you've gotten to a place where you feel like you've lost your joy in ministry. Let me tell you, you will get your joy back the moment you start spending some time with a few Timothys in the room. Now they may think a little differently than you. They may have a different approach. They may have a different personality than you, but they will bring you joy. They will bring you excitement. They will renew a new spirit in you. 
as you build that relationship with them, as you begin that process of passing the torch on to them intentionally. Paul knew Timothy well. He knew his family. He knew where his faith come, came from. And he was convinced of the gifts that Timothy had. He says, for this reason, in verse 6, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God gave us, not a, gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power, love, and self-control. Here's, here's another truth. Here's another practical application. As I've gone throughout ministry in my life, there have been many times where I have walked by in churches or in ministry, I have walked by torches that have been dropped, that needed to be picked up, and somebody had to pick them up. And I'm just young enough and energetic enough, I guess, at the time to go and pick them up. And let me tell you something about doing that. When you pick up a torch of ministry in some way that you don't know anything about, and you have no one in front of you to guide you, to pray with you, to encourage you through it, it is a terrifying process. It's, it's fearful. You experience that spirit of fear. But when you have someone older and wiser that is loving on you and pouring into you and speaking truth into your life and saying, I am with you, I am beside you, giving you opportunities from time to time to sit in their seat but not thrusting it on you all of a sudden, when that process happens the way God intended it to happen, then all of a sudden God instills in, in that young person power. God instills in that person love. God instills in that person self-control. And then they are able to carry that torch and carry it well this really isn't complicated it's something that I'm not really sure why we've allowed it to kind of slip out you know slip off of our radar in our in our church culture today but we have and today I'm beginning the process of begging you challenging you pushing you whatever it is I have to do to say take up the torch. Take it up. If you've put it down, pick it back up. If you haven't started to reach out and begin to receive that torch from someone older and wiser than you, then take it up. Maybe you're listening to this message today and you say, you know what, all of that is really inspiring, but I'm not really sure how to do that. Maybe you don't even have a relationship with Jesus and it starts there because that's what this torch represents. It represents Jesus Christ. That's his flame, not ours. That's his light, not ours. And if you don't know Jesus Christ today, it starts right there. Surrender your life today to Jesus and begin that process. And you will find a church right here at First Baptist that will love on you, that will pour themselves into you, and that are going to commit to walk hand in hand with you and disciple you along the way. I'm going to put tools in your hand. I promise not to leave you hanging. Give me a couple of weeks to kind of get us all going in the same direction. And I'm going to put things in your hands to help this process move forward. But my challenge, my prayer for you today is that you would begin taking up the torch, that you would pray for either God to send a Paul or a Timothy or both your way, that you would begin to pray for specific people in this congregation and pray that the Lord would show you how to begin a relationship with those folks. 